uh, they can just uh, try to uh, uh, use those links. I will try also to put the links on the uh, uh, Blackboard so we will can get access to it. And So now we, we want to talk about those working with unlabeled data. When it's unlabeled data, it's unsupervised. So, um, so I mean, when data is unlabeled, so we need to go to unsupervised learning and supervised learning. Which is which is a more, more general case, in fact, because most of the data around us it's unlabeled, because it's it's really complex to or expensive to label data, so most of the data around us it's unlabeled. And then when we are working with machine learning or artificial intelligence for unlabeled data, we will create what is called strong AI. So when you build a model for unlabeled data, they call it strong AI. But when it's easy for the model, when it's labeled, so they call it uh, weak. Weak AI. So uh, we need to talk about this barometric model. Barometric model, it's a function which takes an image, for example, and return a class label. Um, so for example, if it is for an animal, for example, so which kind of animal in this image, for example, the uh, parameters of this parametric model are initialized to random values. Any feed forward in your network, it's parametric model. And those weights or those parameters are initialized to a random values resulting in random class. So if you have an, if you have, for example, uh, a perceptron, and this perceptron has two inputs, and those two uh, inputs are connected with two parameters, for example, we have bias. When those bias and the parameters are initialized with random values, we should expect that we will get some random class here, would be a random class. So before training your model, you will get a random label or a random class. Uh, So, uh, sorry. So uh, when we train a model, uh, we try to adjust to those parameters. So the function will iteratively gets better and better at correct at correctly classifying the image. So in the initial phase, when we initialize the model parameters, we will get some some random classes. But when we start training the model, uh, with time we will try to reach this uh, level where we can correctly classify the image. For example, at some point, those parameters will be at an optimum. Uh, optimal set uh, of values, for example, meaning that the model cannot get better at classifying those tasks. So we, we can start, if it's a regression problem, we can start with this model, for example. We have, this is my data set, and we will start with some random values. This uh, line, it's omega x plus p, for example, equal zero, correct? So we will initialize those uh, weights and bias with random values, so we will get in random in the decision boundary. We will train the model, so with time, we will try to adjust this uh, parameters in a way to fit those data set, for example. So parametric model can be used also for regression where we try to fit a model to a set of data so we can make predictions for unseen data. A more sophisticated approach might perform even better if it had more parameters or a better internal structure architecture. So when you increase number of parameters, you can solve really more complex uh, problems. Types of machine learning, we have the supervised learning. And in the case of supervised learning, we have labeled the data. Labels are available, correct? When it's unsupervised learning, we don't have labels. We don't have any labels here. So in this case, when it's supervised, it will be weak AI. When it's unsupervised, they call it strong AI. The task in supervised and unsupervised learning is to cluster, label, or classify data, for example. Uh, we have also reinforcement learning in which, uh, in which we try to observe the environment and they perform any task with an a hit and a miss or trial and error approach at the beginning to maximize the success of its outcomes. So it finds it finds the ideal sequence of actions to achieve a desired goal, for example. So maybe this reinforcement learning, I need to go from point A to point B and there are some obstacles in front of me and we have a set of actions. So those actions, it could be fit, uh, move forward turn left, right, for example. So we need to find the optimum sequence of actions which can help us to achieve my goal. In, in a general, is a general framework for solving a control task is this reinforcement learning. It's used for control tasks and robotics, autonomous ships, for example, etc. Reinforcement learning does not know what the right thing to do at each step. However, it has an objective function. 
to maximize on the long run by selecting actions that maximize its reward over and avoid actions that lead to a negative reward. We have a reward function and we'll try to select actions which can try to maximize this reward function, for example. So we have this, uh, uh, I mean, machine learning, it's a subset of deep learning and uh, and uh, deep learning can be used as a learning algorithm for a reinforcement learning and reinforcement learning will be used as a framework for solving the control problems. So also things are connected together. So you can work in reinforcement learning, but also you can use a deep learning approach to try to optimize or as a learning algorithm for this reinforcement learning to maximize your reward function, for example. To solve reinforcement learning, you need to construct environment such as game engine or other APIs, for example. We need to build this simulated environment. Uh, for example, OpenAI has Python gem library, which provides a number of environments and a straightforward interface for reinforcement learning algorithms to start with, to interact with. It's very important because in reinforcement learning, we need to work in this simulated environment because we cannot apply this reinforcement learning in the training phase on our real robots because it will hit doors, it will hit walls. So it will be destroyed before uh, training your model. So it's important to train your vehicle, for example, or simulate your vehicle or your robot and to try to uh, simulate it in an environment, something similar to what uh, a real world, for example, as much as possible. And to try to uh, uh, train your algorithm in this simulated environment. And after that, to try to apply it to your actual robot or vehicle, for example. Field of machine learning has two major branches, supervised and unsupervised. In supervised, labels are available. We mentioned that already. Uh, in case of unsupervised, they don't have labels. Unsupervised learning problems is less clearly defined. So in unsupervised, it's not well defined, the problem. And the harder to solve, it's difficult to solve. But if handled well, the solution will be more powerful, in fact, because as I told you, most of the data around us is unsupervised. The unsupervised system is better than the supervised system at finding new patterns in future data, making the unsupervised solution more uh, agile on a go-forward basis. I mean, in a way, in case of unsupervised learning, it's it's a difficult to solve, it's hard to solve, and but uh, the, I mean, the outcome will be really much better than supervised uh, learning. Why labels are so powerful? Labels are so powerful because we, in supervised learning, we have a cost function, and this cost function, it could be the error, for example, and this error, it's simply the difference between uh, between the target and predictions, correct? Squared, and they divide it by n, for example. It's mean squared error, for example. So it's a very, very important to get those labels. Those are the labels to construct this cost function, right? Labels guided, uh, guides the machine learning model or the AI agent by providing it with an error measure. This is the error measure. So it will help you to know that you are deviating or uh, try to converge or diverge from, uh, because we need to minimize this cost function, for example. So the AI uses this error measure to improve performance over time. Without such labels, the AI does not know how successful it is. We need to know, because this is the guiding signal for us in supervised learning, this error, uh, error signal, or the cost function, it's the guiding uh, message, uh, guiding uh, signal, which help us to know if we are moving in the right direction or in the wrong direction. But the problem here is the cost of labeling those images or image data set, for example, it's very high. It takes too much time and it's expensive really because imagine that you want to build an, a data set, you want to label those data set. If you will do this manually, it will cost you a lot and it will take too much time. Um, also the best known image data sets have only thousands of labels, for example, which might not enough for training some systems. If you want to build a deep learning model, for example, you need maybe millions and millions of images which will take too much time uh, from people to label. Uh, supervised learning system also will be very good at classifying images of objects which has labels, but it will be very poor. It will provide poor performance at classifying images of objects for which it has no labels because it can misclassify it simply. Uh, as powerful as supervised learning systems are, they are limited to generalize, uh, generalizing knowledge beyond the labeled items they have trained on. It will. It will perform very well with the trained data, but it will perform very bad with new images, right? Which does not have any labels. Since the majority of the world's data is unlabeled, so the supervised learning uh, has um, the ability uh, to expand its performance to never before seen data. Um, so supervised learning is, is very good in solving narrow AI problems. The supervised is very good 
in solving narrow AI problems and well defined. I mean, if you really need to use solvers, your problem should be very well defined. Or it will be work within very narrow domain, for example, but not as good as uh, solving, not as good at solving more ambitious, less uh, clearly defined problems of uh, the strong AI type. Um, supervised learning also will uh, defeat and supervise learning at narrow defined tasks. If you have a problem which is very well defined, so in this case, supervised learning will give you much better performance compared to unsupervised, but unsupervised will give you much better results when you have, uh, because it will try to discover patterns which are unknown, for example, or it will perform better with working with data which is constantly changing. Or maybe data which does not have sufficient large labeled data set, for example, it will perform very well with such kind of data sets, for example. So instead of being guided by labels, unsupervised learning, it works by learning the underlying structure of the data it has trained on. And after the initial training, if the unsupervised learning find the images which does not have a label belonging to any of the labeled groups, it will create a separate group for this unclassified image, and it will trigger the human to label the new uh, yet to be labeled groups of images. So for example, if I have unsupervised learning approach, and it can classify people in images, for example, I guess in Facebook we have this, or maybe in Google, for example, you can upload an image, and it will try to classify people in this image, for example. So if it has um, labels for, for, for people from before, it will classify you, for example, as A, B, and C. And if there is a person which is new in this image, it will classify him as a known cluster, and it will trigger you to give him or her a, a new label, for example. And later on, it will use this label for uh, classifying this, uh, the same person in, in, in new images later on. So there are some algorithms, some examples from supervised. Uh, KNN, for example, key nearest neighborhood, and um, I mean, artificial neural network, for example. This is KNN, and in KNN, it's supervised because, uh, uh, because we need to get the labels, and it uses K, K is the hyperparameter here, K is the number of labels, number of neighbors. K is the number of neighbors. So for example, if you selected K equal one, very similar to this circle. So I will try to search, this is my example, and I will try to search for the nearest neighbor, and I will classify this example according to this neighbor. So for example, in this data set, it's a binary classification problem. We have a triangle and, um, triangle and circles. So if K equal one, I will find the nearest K neighbor, for example, and I will check its label if it's a triangle. So this example will be classified as triangle. If you will select K equal three, for example, so in this case, I will try to find the, uh, the three nearest neighbors. It will be this one and this one and this one. And I will do this voting. In those three, I will find that two are circle and one is triangle. So in this case, this new example will be classified as circle, right? So when K is small, I mean this K in the end, it will, it will overfit the data when K is small. And even K is large, it will generalize more, right? It will, it will give you more, more, better, uh, more better solution. It will try to, uh, to generalize. So when K is one, chances to overfit your data set, it will be very, very high when K is small, but you try to increase K, for example, should be three or five, seven. We should also select a K equal odd number because we do some voting here, similar to in sample learning. So in sample learning also, we do this hard voting. So we try to, uh, to see, I mean, because here as example, for example, if you selected K equal four, what will happen? If we selected K equal four, I guess, we the circle will be like this one, right? So it will be like this one. So in this case, when K equal four, in this case, we will have two examples are uh, triangles and two as two circles, two as triangles and two as circles. So, uh, I mean, how, how should we decide this one? Should, should we select this one as a circle or as, triangle, so it will be like, uh, I mean, like a random guess, for example, which is not good. So in this case, we need to select K as odd number all time. It's very, very important to select K as odd number. So it could be, for example, one, three, five, seven, nine, and so on. In case of feedforward neural network, it's the same, we know it. We have some inputs, we have one hidden layer, we have output layer, for example. So we need to calculate the, uh, the error signal here, for example. So the error signal here, it will be the difference between target and the predicted, right? So, so the error signal here, E will be one divided by N multiplied by T minus Y squared. So this is the error signal, which will be used for adjusting those weights and biases using, uh, for example, uh, error backpropagation. 
so this is how K nearest neighborhood works. So we try to use Euclidean distance. They call also Euclidean clustering or classification, Euclidean clustering, because if you have a new example here, which is the green one, I can, I can we can define those key nearest neighbors by calculating the Euclidean, Euclidean distance between this example and the whole set, right? So we calculate the Euclidean distance and we will sort it from small to large and we will select the nearest K, uh, for example. So here in this example, for example, K equals three, in this case, this new example would be classified as triangle, red triangle. So KNN looks at K number, which is integer number of nearest labeled points and the vote on how to label a new point. When K equal one, the algorithm is known as the nearest neighbor algorithm. It will be nearest neighbor. By default, KNN uses a Euclidean distance to measure uh, what is closest and it overfits the data when K is very low. When K is very small, it will overfit your data set and it will underfit the data when K is set to a very large value. KNN is a lazy algorithm, which means that it does not need any training data points for model gen. We don't have a model, in fact. In KNN, it's not parametric, correct? We don't have a model. You cannot say that this is my key nearest neighborhood algorithm. It's just an approach where we calculate the Euclidean distance between each new example and the whole set and sort them in ascending order or descending order and select the nearest uh, key neighbors. So it's a lazy algorithm, which, does, which means that it does not learn, right? It does not clear. We need to keep the whole data set with us all time, right? So it does not need any training data points for model generation. We don't have a model generation. We don't have a model. Can the end classify a new data point? It needs more time to scan all data because we need to calculate the Euclidean distance between the new example and all data points. So it takes too much time. It's, it's time consuming. And also it's not good for memory because we need to keep all those data points with us all time because we need to keep them because I need to calculate the key nearest neighbors. It performs uh, poor also when number of observation and features grow and it becomes computationally efficient. It will be very complex when you have, when this one in two dimensional space, it will be fine, but it could be in three dimensional, fourth dimensional, and fifth dimensional. So in this case, we will calculate the Euclidean distance, which is this one. It's xi minus x squared plus plus plus, where i equal one to n, for example. So it's time consuming and the computationally inefficient algorithm. Number of neighbors is a hyperparameter that you need to choose at the time of model building. We don't build a model in reality, but K is a hyperparameter. You need to select K, it should be one, three, five. So if you will use this K in, 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 uh, in, in the pipeline, it would be nice also to use grid search. So grid search will help you to select the best value for K. Uh, KNN is used to recommend or predict what the user will like, for example, Facebook, uh, Friends, Google Search, Amazon, because it's a clean distance. So, for example, if you are in LinkedIn and I want to see, I want to recommend the potential friends to you, for example, so I will use this a clean distance. I will use the hubs, for example, between you and the other people, and I will try to calculate the clean distance between you and the other people. And if someone is, is closer to you, I will commit him to you, for example, as a friend, right? I mean, maybe you are getting this in Twitter and in, in Facebook. They are using KNN. In fact, they calculate the Euclidean distance between you and other people, and they try to recommend people who are close to you in the hobbies, educations, age, and so on, using this Euclidean distance approach. Uh, how it works, we, we have a point, for example, which is B1, which has an input point, which we need to classify, for example, and we will just select a K, now we will calculate the Euclidean distance between this point, if k equal one, as you can see in this example, if k equal one, this one, it's the nearest. So this one will classify it as a star, for example. If we selected k equal three, in this case, we will do this voting. Those are the three neighbors. So in this case, this point will be classified as a triangle, green triangle. If k equals seven, so it will be, we have three triangles and we have four stars. So in this case, it will be classified as a star, right? Just to remember that when k is small, it will it will over it will overfit, and when k is very large, it will underfit your data set. So it has those three steps for calculating. Uh, I mean, to to do this classification example by example, we need to calculate the distance. We need to find the closest neighbors, and after that, we will do this voting for labels. Uh, k in the end classifier. It's a non-parametric classifier, which means we don't have any models. Right? We don't have any models. We need to store all data points with us all time in, in a vector, for example, or a matrix. And we need to classify each new instance using the majority vote over its set of key nearest neighbors. We need to do this, uh, we need to do this using uh, by computing this Euclidean distance 
uh, between this new example and all data set. It's, it's computationally expensive model. And for k and n, we need to choose a distance function d as a number uh, and the number of neighbors. We need to calculate the distance. And based on this one, we need to also get the number of neighbors which we need to use. And we need to do this uh, voting uh, uh, task. If you want to use KNN, you need to import KNN, uh, key nearest uh, neighbor classifier, key, key neighbors, this function, key neighbors a classifier from, from sklearn.neighbors, if you want to do it, for example. And uh, you need to specify the K value in the neighbors, it's equal five. So now I, I'm selecting K equal five. And I will do this uh, uh, um, hold out validation. So I will use exit train my train for training my model. And I will use test for making the predictions. And from Y predict and Y test, I can do the accuracy score. And at the same time, also I can plot this decision bound. I have three classes here, right? So I have here one class, one class, one class. So after training my model, I can just generate those points and I can generate use those points and use grid um, uh, grid mesh, mesh grid, sorry, for, for creating XG, uh, X grid, Y grid, and sending those numbers to this model and try to predict the classes and plot uh, this decision boundary. So here, this is the accuracy for k equal one. The accuracy was 93%. For equal uh, five, it's 95%. For nine, it's 93%. As I told you, it's, it's, it's a problem here because which value should we select? So it's better to use grid search to try to optimize and find the optimum value for k. As you can see, for one equal, uh, for k equal one, the accuracy was less. When it's five, it's much higher. When it's nine, it's 93%. It goes down again, which means here it's it's underfitting. Maybe here it's underfitting. This one here, it's overfitting. But of course, you can discover this from the accuracy for the training and test set if we need to discover uh, this problem. So this is the decision boundary for k equal one. This one for k equal... Um, so, so for k equal one, you can see here, it's also overfitting. Because this decision boundary is very complex, in fact, you know, cannot generalize, do you see? Very complex decision boundary. When you increase it to five, for example, it's more, more, much better. And also when k equals six, maybe it looks like, like this one. So uh, this is the uh, KNN, which is supervised. We need to talk about some unsupervised algorithms. We use principal component analysis and the principal component analysis, it's dimensional reduction algorithm. It can be used for dimensional reduction and it's unsupervised. Because we use X, we use only X. Do you remember BCA of X, correct? So it does not use uh, the target features. It uses only the input features. We can also uh, try to talk about key means the clustering algorithm, KMC. KMC, key means the clustering. It's unsupervised learning algorithm. We can use auto autoencoder. Autoencoder also we can use it as for feature extraction or dimensional reduction. So it's it's a very similar to principal component analysis. And it's unsupervised, right? We can use it for the feature extraction or dimensionality uh, reduction. If we want to use BCA for dimensional reduction, um, it projects the high, highest dimensional input data to a low dimensional space. It filters out uh, not so relevant features and the key as much as of the interesting ones as possible. It allows AI to be more efficient in solving large scale and computationally expensive problems. It, it, I mean, it's, it's fantastic principal component analysis because it will help us to simplify our models. Imagine that I have a model and maybe in the input layer, I need to use maybe 10. So when you when you are using 10, it will be complex, but you can use principal component analysis and I can use a, uh, three principal components instead of 10. So it will help me to simplify my model. Yes. Uh, Okay, so key means the clustering. Once we have reduced the set of original uh, features to a smaller uh, and manageable set, we can find the interesting patterns by grouping similar instances of data together. We, with key means the clustering, we specify the number of desired clusters. It's unsupervised algorithm. So we need to define the desired number of clusters. This is user defined, right? I have a data set, for example, like Iris data set, and it looks like this one. This is Iris data set. I have three classes here. Right, so you can look into it by yourself, by a domain expert, for example, and you can say, okay, this data looks like three clusters. So in this case, I need to select k equal three, and I will I will use k means the clustering to find the centroid of each cluster, right? But k it's user defined. So someone he will say that, please classify this data into two. Someone else he will say classify it into three. If we'll classify it into three, 
it will be like this one, for example, we have three clusters. If you said, no, I want it to be two. So in this case, maybe we'll combine those two into one. So, okay, it's a number of clusters and it's user defined. So to speed up this clustering process, key means randomly assign each observation to one of the uh, key clusters and then bring, uh, try to use a Euclidean distance and try to update this centroid until we have a point which is in the middle of each cluster, for example. And if you have a new data point in the future, for example, this one, we will calculate the Euclidean distance between this data point and each centroid, and it will be assigned to the closest one, for example. So this is class one, class two, class three. If this one is closer to class three, it will be assigned to class three, for example. So this algorithm is very simple. So at the end, we will have three centroids, and we will calculate the Euclidean distance between each example and the three centroid, and the data point will be assigned to uh, the label of the closest centroid, that is it. So this is an example of iris data set. Uh, we have three clusters here, as you can see. So we need to define K first. I need to use uh, uh, SC, uh, key means. Key means you can import it from sklearn.cluster, as you can see it here. Key means clustering. We need to import it from sklearn.cluster. This is my data set. We need to use min max scalar, for example. We divided the data using a trend test split, for example. Now I want to use key means clustering. Key means clustering, I need to define this number, number of clusters, it's user defined. Maximum number of iterations, there is no problem here. Random state, because maybe if you need to repeat your results or reproduce it, you need to use this random state equal 42, for example. You fit your model using exit train, and after that you can print your centroids. If you selected k equal three, you will get three centroids. So it would be those three dots, three dots. Those are the centers of the clusters. If you want to check the accuracy, so you're just using X, uh, uh, I need to predict uh, the Y predict for X test as we did before. And after that, I will calculate the accuracy of this uh, one. So it will be 91%, right? It will be 91%. So after doing, after training your model, you will have those three centroids. Imagine that I have a data point, which is new data point here and I need to classify it. So I will calculate the Euclidean distance between this point and each centroid, right? So I will have three Euclidean distances and it will be assigned to the cluster with the closest uh, uh, centroid. So this one, uh, it's, it's clear that it's closer to this one. So to be classified, I will call this one C1, C2, C3. So this one will be classified as C2, correct? According to this approach. Autoencoder, it's fit forward the neural network. As you can see here, it's feed forward the neural network. Uh, and uh, where is the input as the same as the input size? It's a symmetric. First of all, it's a symmetric, right? So that part, a number of layers here equal to the number of layers here. It consists of decoder and encoder, or encoder and the decoder. Number of layers in the encoder, it's exactly the same as the decoder, for example. Number of inputs uh, here, it's exactly the same as the number of outputs, right? Uh, and it is used to compress the input into a lower dimensional. We have here this code. So it is used to compress the input into a lower dimensional code and then reconstruct the output from this uh, representation. So in fact, we have the input. Maybe those input, it's an image. If it's a nested data set, for example, this one, it's 28 times 28. And I need to reduce it to a code or compress it into a code. And this code consists of three bits, for example. So I need to convert this one from 28 times 28 pixel values into three or four or five. So I will train this encoder decoder to try to do this compression. Uh, so the encoder uh, will try to compress this image into the slower representation. And the decoder will use this code to reconstruct the image again, how it is trained. In the output layer here, we will calculate the reconstruction error, which is the output between those pixel values and the targets. Correct. We will calculate this uh, reconstruction error and we will go backward using error back propagation to adjust to those weights. After training this uh, autoencoder, we will divide it. I mean, after training it, uh, we will just uh, divide it. We will split it into two and we will use only that part, which is the encoder for data compression because the input will be the original image and the output will be this code. So we will use it for data compression. Uh, some people use it for uh, uh, for um, denoising, for example. So in this case, we need to keep the decoder with us because maybe the input image will be noise image or image plus noise. Correct. We will we train it like this one. We the input will be image plus noise, 
and the output will be the original image, the original image. So in this case, we will train this autoencoder to, uh, to remove noise from the image. So people use it for data compression and some other people use it for other applications like denoising. And as you can see here, it's, it's unsupervised because we are working with the input features. We are not working with the targets. We are just working with the input, uh, with the input features or the pixel values, for example. If you want to use this autoencoder for IS, uh, we need to define this autoencoder using sequential EBI from, S, uh, from uh, Keras. So autoencoder equals sequential EBI. As I told you, it should be uh, symmetric. So we need to define, uh, so this is the encoder. It could be like just simple, very simple like this one. So the, uh, the code here has a size of 32 and we have here an input image, which has a size of 28 times 28, which is 784. And so this is the encoder and the decoder will be just this uh, output layer. And this output layer has a size of 784. So it would be like this one. We will train this one to compress each image from uh, 784 to 32, right? And after training this autoencoder, we will split it and we will use this one for data compression. So now if I need to build a model for classifying Iris data set, I don't need to work with a 784, but I can work with a 32 and working with 32 pixel values that will really help me to simplify my, uh, my model a lot because the model will be much simpler. And when we, when we use this autoencoder, it's easy in fact to, to stack this one together, I mean, to stack this layer with my model. So after deciding my model, I will have a model here, for example, which, which has 302 inputs, right? Maybe this is my model. It will be like this one. So I can just, uh, uh, I can uh, stick this one into here. So I will have this uh, encoder here, right? So this is the original image which is 784. It will compress each original image into this code and it will send it to my fit for. So this one will be fit forward the neural network or a deep learning model, for example. And this one will be the encoder. So the idea here of the encoder, it's fit forward the neural network and it's easy to, to just stick it with any models. So the model will look uh, okay, so the first part will be uh, uh, compression, data compression, and the second part will be classification. So this one will do classification, and this part will do data compression, right? So this is my autoencoder, so it's a sequential EBI, and it consists of two layers. So the first layer will be the encoder, the second layer will be the decoder. So the encoder will convert the input image from its original dimension 784 into 32. And the decoder will do uh, will uh, try to reconstruct this image from 32 into 784, right? Just the training this autoencoder, and and uh, as you can see here, this uh, so this is the number of parameters in my encoder. So number of parameters here it will be 784 multiplied by 32 plus 32, right? And the number of parameters here in the output it will be. 32 multiplied by 784 plus 784 bias. So this number is larger than this number, right? So um, this is the encoder. I know I, I want to split it now. So the encoder will be, uh, I need to define a new model. And this model will have uh, the inputs from, uh, it will be the autoencoder inputs, the same size. And the output, it will be the autoencoder layer number zero because I have only two, two layers, zero and one. So layer number zero, in fact, it's the autoencoder. So I need, now I can reconstruct my autoencoder. So the input to this one will be the X test, right? When it's X test, the output will be the encoded image. If you want to reconstruct, if you want to reconstruct the, uh, so in, in this case, this is the original input and this one will be the code. This one will be 32 pixel values, correct? So this is the code which is representing each digit of those. This one, it's 28 times 28 pixel values. Right, grayscale. If you want to get the decoder, for example, so the decoder as the input shape would be 32. You need to define a model which has an input shape of 32. And the output will be the output from the encoder. It will be layer, last layer, minus zero or one, in fact. So this is the last layer because it consists of two layers. The input to this uh, decoder, it will be the encoded image, right? This is the encoded image. And the output will be the decoded image or reconstructed image. Decoded image or reconstructed image. You can do this, as you can see here, this is the original image. And this one, it's the code, right? 
this one it's reconstructed, reconstructed. And of course, this reconstructed image, it's less, uh, less uh, resolution compared to the original image, because in fact, we reconstructed this image using this code. This is the original, and this is the reconstructed using this code, right? It maybe if you increase the size of this one, maybe 32 is not enough. If you can increase it to 64, maybe in this case, you will get much better resolution of uh, the reconstructed image. Just and more examples. So now I can see that reconstructed image at seven, it's still clear for me, but remember that this one has been reconstructed using this code, right? So in this case, instead of working with the original image, I can use this code for training my model and uh, for classifying model. So instead of building a model with 28 times 28 inputs, I can just build a model with this code, which has 32 input uh, pixel values, right? So maybe some in some cases it will be difficult. Maybe this is nine. It's, maybe this one looks nine, but of course we lose some. Info. This is five, of course. Of course we lose some resolution. We lose some information, but for simplicity, so we have a trade off trade off between simplicity and resolution. If you want to simplify your model, we will use this autoencoder for uh, 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 compression, data compression. So in this case, we will compress the data into those thirty-two pixel values at the cost of reducing the resolution of the reconstructed image. But it will still possible for us to understand that this one is still one, this one is still four, correct? Uh, we have this autoencoder, which consists of two layers, for example. You can say that it's shallow uh, autoencoder. If you want to make it deep, just to try to increase number of hidden layers. When you increase the number of hidden layers, it will be deep autoencoder. So for example, we can have an example here. So this is the autoencoder. We cons it consists of six layers. The encoder consists of three layers, and the decoder consists of another six. It must be, it must be symmetric, right? So the input dimension here it's seven eight four. The input, uh, the output from this, uh, uh, the second layer, for example, it has one hundred twenty eight. The second layer has uh, sixty four and thirty two. So now we go gradually from seven eight four to one hundred twenty eight to sixty four to thirty two. So it will be like this one. So this is the first layer, which is. Uh, 784, the second layer, which is 128, this one, which is 64, this one, which is 32, and then we will go up again in the decoder. So this one will be in the encoder. This one will be the decoder, right? We will do the same exactly. And after that, we will define, we need to define the autoencoder, so we need to split it. So I need to define a new model, right? which is called the encoder and this uh, model uh, the inputs, it's the encoder input and the output, it's the output from the autoencoder layer number two because layers are uh, numbered zero, one, we have three layers, two, three, four, five, right? So, so, the, uh, so the output for the encoder, it will be the output from layer number two and for the decoder, it will be the output from number five. I mean, this one, it's number five. In fact, or minus one means it's the last one. So this one, it could be five, or it could be minus one, which is the last layer. So it's layer number three. So the decoder layer number three, it's this one. You can define it as layer of minus one because this is the last layer, or you can just say because the last layer in a way it's number five. You can replace it with number five. So this is the response when it's deep, uh, deep autoencoder, maybe the performance is much better. This is the original image. This is the code, and this is the reconstructed image. Maybe the resolution is much better than the shallow autoencoder. Uh, if you want to make some changes, maybe because I mean here I used, in fact, we use the linear activation function. We got this kind of performance. Maybe if you can use the activation function to RELU, you will get much better performance. Do you see? I got here RELU, for example, when we use a different activation function, this is the original image, this is reconstructed. It's exactly the same as you can see it here. So there is no difference in fact between the original image and the reconstructed image when we use RELU. So this is the power or um, the impact of uh, choosing a different activation function. I mean, we can we can understand it because when it's deep uh, autoencoder, maybe we will have this uh, uh, vanishing gradient problem. So it's much better to use RELU in this case. When we use RELU, we will get much, much better performance as you can see it here, right? Uh, can we use this autoencoder for something else? Yes, we can use it for denoising, and it will be the same, but instead of uh, using an input image, 
I mean, it will be this auto encoder. I will just plot it like this one. So this one, it's the encoder. Decoder. This is the input image. And the output, I will just call it reconstructed image. Recon reconstructed image. If you want to use it as a denoising, in this case, we need to, uh, the input, it will be the input image plus noise. We need to add random noise, not noise. And reconstructed, uh, in the training process, uh, the, uh, we will get the reconstructed image and we will uh, calculate the reconstructed reconstruction error, which is the difference between the input image minus reconstructed image. So the reconstruction error here, it will be reconstruction error. It will be the difference between the original image minus reconstructed, correct? So in this case, the input will be image plus noise. The output will be reconstructed image. So we try to uh, minimize the difference between reconstructed image and the image itself. So in this case, we will try to remove the noise from the image. So just to build your own data set, you have those input images. Add to it some random noise. So this is five, five plus noise. And after that, we will train the model. And if you want to test it, so the input will be image plus noise. This one, for example, it's image plus noise. And as you can see, this is a reconstructed, reconstructed image. And as you can see here in this reconstructed image, we removed noise from it. So in this case, we can use autoencoder as uh, denoising, right? So you can do the same. I mean, uh, um, it's just a home assignment, for example, it's a face recognition. We have this Fitch, uh, Fitch Olvetti faces, if you want to build something, for example. So uh, you can try to, uh, sorry. So this is a data set which can be used for, I mean, testing this. Uh, so try to use this um, Olvetti faces, for example, and to try to maybe build, build an application. So the idea here is to try to show those images and divide the data into training and validation and testing, right? All the out validation, this is step. And after that, you will use principal component analysis for dimensionality reduction. It could be, uh, and also use it on code for reconstruct using a compressed representation using the code, for example. So try to solve this problem using principal component, using autoencoder. Try to use an supervised algorithm, for example, like uh, key means clustering. Correct? Use a supervised algorithm. So supervised algorithm that could be MLP, and it could be also key means uh, K, uh, KNN, for example, which is a supervised algorithm. Try to plot the confusion matrix. Try to do this cross validation, right? Try to test the uh, cost gradient, the descent batch gradient, and the mini batch gradient, for example. In fact, I propose you to use the pipeline here also, right? Machine pipelining in this uh, example. Yes. So I hope that you are still following me. Uh, do you have any questions for that part? Any questions, please? Uh, hi, I would have uh, just one question. Uh, when would be the deadline for the submission of our project reports or in the form of paper? Look, uh, for, for BHD courses, we, are, we have more flexibility. It's not a master course or it's not yeah. a bachelor course. So it's up to us if we need to get more extensions or more time. So it's up okay. to us because we don't have the same deadlines as bachelor courses or master courses. Okay, so yeah. it should be just, uh, maybe we need to take two weeks uh, off after the course. And after the course, by two weeks or three weeks, you can submit your report. So you can have enough time to work on your project. Okay, so when, I don't know when are you planning to finish the lectures? Maybe we need, maybe, it's, uh, I don't know uh, how much uh, how much more you want to, for, for example, we didn't start, uh, we need to cover those uh, deep learning stuff and the transfer learning stuff. Okay. So maybe we need maybe four or five weeks, and after that we can uh, we can. Okay, so uh, it's like kind of end of May probably. Yeah, for example, yes. Okay, okay, just approximately. To know. Okay. Yeah, but but as I told you, uh, we don't have those limitations or constraints of other courses, because we can just by we can decide in fact when we need yeah. to submit the project or. Okay, that's so, great. Uh, it's just a much much better to finish it before summer holiday because people will go for holidays. Yeah, of and, course. Uh, yeah, but I like at master or bachelor. That's end of May usually. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, entire May is like uh, those exams. That's why I thought will we have the same. Yes, <laughs> and and also usually also I give people some some people need more extensions so they can 
uh, take extension until after summer and they can submit it after summer oh, for example okay, if they need more time so great. it's it's a very flexible for phd uh, people because uh, they have other stuff to do also and it's much better also to have enough time to write something more about you for example which can yeah, be used in your great. phd i mean the idea here is not writing something very quick and submit it to a conference or something the idea here is to do really good work and try to get it published so it can be part of your phd publication plan yeah, that's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. So we we, we don't have any problem. Uh, we can just have uh, maybe a deadline, for example, end of May or right. Um, yeah. Maybe first week or second week of June, for example. Correct. Yeah, even better for sure. It will be much better. So it's so the most important is to just have one week before summer holidays. So I and uh, my uh, sensor, we can go through those uh, uh, projects, read it, and just. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and 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 they grade it, for example, it's best and the fail. We don't have any grades here. We don't have A, B, C, and D. Yeah, I know. But it will be best and the fail. So, yeah. so I just me and the, and the sensor. We need to have time, so we can sit together, go through those uh, projects, read it, and uh, try to make uh, evaluations and submit it to the system, because maybe we will have a problem in the system here. So it's better to do it before people go into summer holidays to finish it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So maybe also uh, I propose to take next week off so people can work in their uh, projects and uh, we can meet, for example, one week after, right? So, so the, uh, for example, we can take next week off so people can have time to work in their projects and the week after we can have uh, maybe quick presentations of some progress if they would like to. And at the same time, also, I can start in the next task so we can try to finish uh, things which we need to finish. But the most important is to try to implement those techniques in your project, for example, and to try to work on the results section uh, to make it really, uh, I mean, good. And uh, and and the, the minimum requirements for the course to base it, it's to write something which is publishable, for example, which can be published. So it should be in the format of a conference paper, for example, or uh, a journal paper. It will be much better. But it should it should contain something which is publishable, right? I, I, I don't want you to publish it now, but you can publish it later, right? So after the course, you can just get this report to try to refine it, work with your co-supervision team or super, supervision team, for example, and to try to publish it. But at least you can have a draft, for example. So the report should consist of components of uh, maybe a conference paper, for example. We have title, we have abstract, we have introduction, literature review, background, materials and method, results, concluding remarks, Summary, for example, so it should contain all, all items or all sections of a conference paper. Yes. Um, so any question, please, for today? Any questions? Any questions, please? No questions? OK, because also I have a small uh, um it's 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 the final stuff because but maybe you can go through it by yourself we have this um uh, no not this one so this uh, synthetic two moons data sets it's uh, just a data set in fact if you can see my screen so it's just something it's just for fun it's a synthetic two moons data set. It's a data set which can be just to can generate those data set and try to use it for uh, for just the playing with it, for example, for testing an algorithm, for example. It's something called the make moons, make moons. And you can import it from sklearn dot data sets. And you can plot it. So when you generate it, for example, you get X and Y. It's two dimensional data set. So you have two features and you have uh, those target values. And it's binary classification problem, for example. So you can select here a number of samples. It could be, for example, 5,000 points. And you can uh, select the noise value here. And this amount of noise, it will control the amount of overlaps between those two classes. And it's binary classification problem, as you can see. You can plot it. And you can use it for testing, for example, MLB classifier and the KNN, for example. And we agreed that KNN, it's a Euclidean classifier, right? Euclidean classifier. So if you want to use uh, MLB classifier, for example, you need to, you can uh, develop it using sequential um, API from uh, Keras, for example. And as you can see here, uh, the input layer has four uh, four nodes. The input shape is two, 
because it's too uh, it's it's binary it's the uh, it's too, uh, it's two D uh, data set for example we have two input features x one and x two so we need to start with this layer for example so this is a, uh, this layer has four four units it's a dense layer which has four neurons and the input shape is two right you can give it a name for example layer one for example and uh, we need to have another layer for example which has two units we need to select the activation layer by default i guess here as uh, the activation layer would be maybe it would be sigmoid i don't remember in fact if you don't specify the activation function so by maybe by default it will be sigmoid or linear or something so in the second layer here the second dense layer it has two units two neurons the activation layer is RELU. You can give it a name also. And after that, we will have an output layer. Maybe this output layer has one. The activation function, it's a sigmoid, for example. And we call it prediction layer or something, correct? You will need to compile this model. You need to select the optimizer, which is SCGD, for example, binary cross entropy, because it's binary classification problem. And the metrics here, it's accuracy. It could be error, whatever. So we selected here accuracy. So this is MLB, and how can we implement it quickly? In Keras. Uh, so this is the model. You can print the summary of the model. So this model has 12 parameters. Those 12 parameters are in fact four because we have here four times two. So it's a four times two plus four bias. So those 12, it's four times two plus four. I hope that you understand this one. Two times four, it's eight plus four, it's a 12 because we have eight, two times four, eight weights. Two times four plus four bias. This one has 10 parameters, which is 2 times 4 plus 2. So those 10, it's 2 times 4 plus 2. The output layer here, it has three parameters, which is 1 times 2, because we have omega 1, 1, omega 2, 1, for example, something like this. So it will be, those one, it will be 2 times 1 plus 1, so it will be three parameters. So a uh, total number of parameters will be 25, which is 3 plus 12 plus 10, which is 25. All those parameters are trainable. Non-trainable parameters equal zero. When we use transfer learning, we will have number here in non-trainable because we can freeze a model, for example. So non-trainable parameters will be a number. Uh, if you need to use this model, you need to fit your model using X train, Y train. I used here min, min batch, uh, min batch gradient, for example. So I decided min batch uh, batch size equal 128, and and the validation split is 20 percent. So 20 percent will be used for validation. I trained my model. I want to plot the decision boundary. When you are training your model, you can just write history equal model dot fit. So from this history, you can get loss function and the validation loss, accuracy and validation accuracy. It's a training loss, validation accuracy, training accuracy and validation accuracy. And you can plot this curve and this curve will show you if your model is overfitting, right? So we have here this loss, it goes down when we are starting at epoch number zero. So the, the loss was very high, and most time it will go down, correct? And also uh, the, the accuracy also, it, when we are starting, it's a very low number, because here, when we initialize our parameters with random values, we will do some random classification here. So it will be random class. We will do some random classification here, so the accuracy will be very low, but it will increase over time until we reach uh, high value, around 100%, for example. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a training loss, Training accuracy, validation loss, and validation accuracy. So, so the validation accuracy, it's 20% of the data are used for validation. Uh, from this graph, you can discover if your model will overfit your data set, right? So for the validation, if the validation loss, for example, it will go down at some point, it means your model will start, uh, or validation accuracy, it can go increase to some point, and at some point it will start to go down, which means your model is started to overfit your data set. If you want to, uh, uh, Calculate the confusion matrix. We need to import it from metrics and also precision score, recall score. Maybe also can use F1 score, right? You can get all those numbers here. Maybe you can have this classification report. You will get all those numbers in one step. Uh, the confusion matrix, it's here, which means we have two classes. I can call up class zero and one. So the zero and one, so which means uh, 619 from class zero classified as zero. This one misclassified, this one misclassified, this one correctly classified, right? If you want to get this decision boundary, you need to, uh, for the test set, you need to create this grid for X1 and X2, and send it for the model to predict the classes. 
So in this case, he will plot this uh, decision boundaries. If you want to use KNN, we need to import the KNN from uh, sklearn.neighbors. You need to define k neighbors. What is the k neighbors? The three. But remember that when it's a three, it's a very low number compared to the size of my data set. So as you can see here, the system, maybe it's overfitting, right? Because this one is very complex decision boundary, right? Maybe you can try it with k equal five, for example. Remember that this number should be odd number all time because we do voting. And when we do voting, it's preferred to have odd number of neighbors. So it could be three, it could be five, seven, and so on. So it's just like an application for the things which we started today. So thank you very much for today. And please let me know if you have any questions so I can answer it. And I guess next week, can have next week off so you can work in your project. And the next week, please, please try to prepare a few slides, one slide or two, about some initial results. So you can present it uh, after two weeks from now. And also uh, after that, also we will continue with other stuff. Maybe next week we can start, I mean, uh, the week after we can start with those deep learning stuff and the transfer learning stuff. We have an amount, we will finish it with time. So don't worry about this. We will finish it before summer holiday. And also you will have enough time to work on your proposal and we can expand it a little bit so you can really submit a good report. The most important is to submit something which has potential to be published. So it can be part from your uh, PhD publication plan. Is there any question, please? Uh, so you have all material uh, in Blackboard and uh, also uh, uh, the lectures for today are recorded. So I will put links in, uh, but also you have the link for all those streams. So for people who uh, didn't attend the meeting today, they can go to those uh, videos and they're trying to see the lecture. So in this case, if we will not take lecture next week, you will have it for uh, working in your uh, projects. Uh, we will see you after two weeks from today. So thank you very much for today. And thanks for thank accepting you. the change today because today is a very hectic day. So it's better to have lecture today. But uh, after that, it will be each Friday uh, as normal. Yes. So thank you very much. And please, uh, those who are in the reference group, try please to try to work in the uh, report and uh, try to share it with me, please, before submitting it to Casper. So thank you very much for today. Yeah, have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.